Good evening. Did y'all have to put up with Jonathan this morning? Did that, they, <laughs> you just dealt with it as good as you could. I'm so proud of you. It's everyone has a burden to bear and a cross to carry. And sometimes you just, I know better than that. I'm grateful he's here. And I know a uh, quality presentation that he does tonight. Uh, before we get started, let me, can you throw up that men's retreat thing? Can you? I think I created that in time, I hope. This is two weeks from today, two weeks from this weekend. These men are getting together. At least you can if you show up. You can't if you don't. There's fishing, there's golfing, and there's some real good time for us to be together and, and, and answer some, or, or talk about some, some challenging things that pertain to us as men of God. And I really want to encourage all of you men to consider this. It doesn't matter what age you are. Come out there. It's Greer's Ferry somewhere in Heber Springs. There's a guy I know who says, I want you to use my cabin, the cabins of all my friends. It's no cost to you. I'm making the food and all that stuff. How can you turn down an offer like that? I, you can't turn down an offer like that. And I said, well, we'll come. We'll get all the people we can. And uh, there's just, this is an interesting guy. You're going to hear his story when you get down there. And you're going to find him very compelling. And it's worth listening to. It's worth coming out there. If you want to fish, you can fish. You want to golf, you can golf. You can't do both. I don't know how you'd pull that off. But you can do one or the other. And we just want to urge you men to consider taking some time to invest in your spiritual leadership responsibility as men. So uh, jot this down two weeks, two weekends from now, be at this thing. It's going to be well worth your effort to be there. Turn up the wood to the book of Exodus. We're going to be jumping around a few places because we're taking on the plagues in total. I want to treat our services as WebMD. Has anybody ever been to WebMD? Most doctors say don't do this because you go in and you put all your symptoms in and it churns out the answer of what it could possibly be. It kind of diagnoses you and of course every symptom you have is of the worst kind of cancer, the rarest form of cancer that's going to get you within four hours and you're sitting there nervous and you go to a doctor and he says all you got is, a, is an ingrown toenail. Don't worry about it, right? So we get a little bit hyper excited about WebMD uh, but, today, but, but for the next few weeks we're going to be dealing with hardness of heart. Uh, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna find a biblical character, obviously. This slide tells you this, but if you're going to look at a Bible character to help you diagnose in yourself the symptoms of a hardened heart, which Bible character would that be? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. We got a brilliant crowd on a Sunday night. That's right, Pharaoh, because over and over and over it again, it says he hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. So this is the absolute example of what hardness of heart looks like. And in this series, we're going to have the same invitation song every time, and it's number 792. Would you open up your song books to 792? I haven't told Danny this yet, and he may not even know this song, so I may, I may be just doing this myself. 792 for the next four weeks, five weeks, is going to be our song. It's our symptom song. It's a WebMD song. And it goes like this, my eyes are dry, I can't weep. For some reason, though I know I may be wrong, I can't get myself to mourn. And blessed are those who mourn. But what happens if you can't because your eyes are dry? You want to, you know you need to, you know you should, you just can't. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold. They're ditto prayers. Same thing as yesterday, God, just ditto. And I know how I ought to be, alive to you and dead to me. I know how I need to be, but I want to be, but I can't get there. For some reason, something's blocking me. I don't know if this describes any period of your life, but most Christians go through a season like this. Some people live a life like this. What I like about it is it's not just diagnosis. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Michael, you know this, you know this one? Would you lead it right now, just right now? 
And everybody sing this song together. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Thank you. We will. I, I'm, I'm, I'm usurping authority over an elder. That's going to be the invitation song here in a minute, too. So whatever he picked, void it. Preacher, bypass that. That's terrible to do. So for the next few Sunday nights, I don't want this to be a thing where you come to church and you just sit there and you kind of critique whether it's entertaining or not. I want you to bring your entire life in your mind with you, and I want us to compare our lives to Pharaoh's. Because as you read these chapters in Exodus, anywhere from chapter 3 through about chapter 10, over and over again, the heart of Pharaoh is talked about as being hardened. A graphic description of something we're familiar with. Stubborn, set in its mind, cannot change, cannot soften. And here's the thing about the Christian life, and Paul even says it especially when he talks in Acts 17. He says, God commands everyone everywhere to repent. The secret to being right with God and the secret to salvation and forgiveness is, can you change? Can you change your direction in your life? But what happens when the secret to your spiritual life with God is changing your heart, but you can't change? No matter what you do, you can't get yourself to change. You can't get your mind to change. You can't get your heart to change. There is no hope for you because repentance is the key to everything. That's where Pharaoh was. His heart was hardened. And the interesting thing is you read this passage, and everybody debates this, and it's one of those things I'm not going to make everybody agree with what I'm saying. This is a classic, timeless, never-to-be-resolved issue is this. Who's responsible for Pharaoh's hardened heart? Because sometimes it says in the text, God hardened Pharaoh's heart over and over again. Let me just give you one example. If you'll turn to Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. And this is really before they even start. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart, and he won't let the people go. God hardened his heart. Is Pharaoh still responsible when God's the one who did it? That's what everybody wants to know. Jonathan's going to give a sermon on this in September and answer that question. Secondly, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Just one of them. Chapter 7, verse 13. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen to him as the Lord had said. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And other times it says, like in chapter 7, verses 22, 23, chapter 8, verse 19, some of those on, it just says his heart was hardened. It didn't say who did it. So the question becomes, who's responsible for this condition Pharaoh's in? Is God doing this to where Pharaoh doesn't have any free will at all? Is Pharaoh doing this? Then why is God held responsible? Pharaoh was this powerful man viewed by his people as some sort of divine being. He likely thought of himself this way too. Really heightened awareness. Kind of like absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, right? Like I'm, the, I'm really the one who has the ultimate say in life and death over everybody. Pretty much stuck on himself as the one who's kind of like sovereign over all the world, set in his ways. And God wants him to let his people go. But Pharaoh, who thinks he's sovereign, decides to set his heart against what God wants. And when human beings want to do what they want to do, and God says, you must do what I'm going to do, there is fireworks awaiting Something's got to give. God knew this. He told Moses, even before the plague start in chapter 3, I'm going to have to do some amazing things to compel Pharaoh to respond. 
God's sovereignty goes against a man who thinks he's sovereign and there's something really, really in the works here. He thinks he's so much more powerful than the God of his slaves. And so now there's this thing set up. And here's how it happened. Pharaoh is completely convinced of his own authority over the world. God comes in giving evidence to the contrary. I am going to change your mind. I want you to do something and I'm going to change your mind. And I'm going to send you one plague after another to get you to change your mind. But all it does is harden him. It doesn't soften him at all. God's disciplinary measures, instead of causing him to soften, cause him to get harder and harder and harder. So did God do that? Yes, he sent them. His intention was to soften him and change his mind. But Pharaoh, because of his nature, just got harder and harder. It's, it's the image we've always used in the sun. You set out a block of butter and a block of some wet clay. You've just made a vase or something. You set them both out in the sun and one of them hardens and one of them softens. It's just the nature of the material you're working with. God's trying to change his mind and tell him who's boss. And he's not real receptive to the God's way of communicating. And then sometimes it's just the events themselves that are blamed. Here's what I think is the truth. Everybody's going to serve God one way or another. You can serve him as a paid employee and receive benefits. Or you can serve him as a forced volunteer. He's going to get his glory out of you one way or the other. And it seems to me your best option is to receive some benefits from it. And that may seem all academic to us, but this is a great, great thing to study as we look at the characteristics of Pharaoh. There are four of them. We're going to look at them in the coming weeks. But what is hardness of heart exactly? Chapter 7, verse 4, is one of the places where it says this over and over again. He would say something like, Pharaoh will not listen to you. I'm going to lay my hand on Egypt, bring my host, my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt with great acts of judgment. I'm going to do these great things, but Pharaoh will not listen to you. And as he says in chapter 7, verse 13, still Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen. This is what hardness of heart means. I know what God wants me to do. He's made it clear, but I am not going to listen. I'm not going to do what he wants me to. You ever been in this spot? Maybe you want to want to, but you can't get yourself to want to. You wish you could. You know full well what God wants for you, whether it's your marriage or your parenting skills or your, just your, your life before God. You know how God wants you to conduct yourself, but you can't make yourself do it. You're just stubborn, and you just, you just can't listen. You can't hear him. You know what he says, but you're not going to listen. That's where Pharaoh was. He's unyielding. A person driving down a highway and he never yields even though he's supposed to, he's eventually going to crash. And that's what's going to happen with a person who's hard of heart. But keep in mind, the next few weeks we're going to look at the symptoms of a hardened heart from Pharaoh. And you can see if those symptoms exist in your own life. And each time we'll try to figure out how can we change this. But they weren't the only ones. Pharaoh wasn't the only one with this problem. I want you to look to Exodus chapter 5 with me for a second. You know the story. We're not going to read the whole thing. Moses, with excitement and anticipation, goes to Pharaoh and says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And, of course, Pharaoh says, who's God? I don't even know who he is. We'll talk about that next time. And then he goes on to describe this in chapter 5 as, as when he does this. And then Pharaoh responds to what, is, what Moses is asking. And instead of responding, he says, I'll tell you what, you guys have too much time on your hands. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make you work harder. I'm going I'm to keep your quota of making bricks for me the same, but I'm not going to provide the straw with which you make them. You go out and get your own straw and you make your own bricks and you have to give the same number. And all of a sudden it comes back on the people, this action of Moses that was to serve the people comes back and slaps the people. They come back at the end of this and all of a sudden they realize their slavery has just become harder. It backfires and Moses is frustrated. His people are murmuring and complaining and hurt because of the fact that their, their, their slave labor is made worse. And I want you to look with me at chapter 6, verse 9. He goes before the people and says, hey, God's hearing you. God loves you. God's going to redeem you, but they don't listen. Moses spoke this to the people of Israel. They did not listen. Why? Because of their broken spirit and the harsh slavery. 
if hardness of heart is a refusal to listen, Israel was hardened of heart too. But it was for a different reason. Their spirit was broken. They wanted to believe in God, but when they risked believing in God, it backfired and things didn't go the way they expected them to and they're hurting. They are not listening, not because of the same reason as Pharaoh. They're not listening because they dared to believe in God and when they did something, things backfired and didn't go well. Has this ever happened to you? You have a dream. My marriage is going to go this way and we're going to have a wonderful happiness ever after and you get married and it becomes challenge after challenge and real work and real struggle and you say, God, if this is really supposed supposed to be the marriage that is before you then it should be easier than this and you get disoriented and you quit listening to everything he says people with broken hearts and people with devastated lives and things that happen that they don't think God would ever let happen they come into their lives and it disheartens them and they're disoriented and all of a sudden they're not listening to God either different reason than Pharaoh but it's still a hardness of heart. And their circumstances were harsh. Life is harder. I didn't anticipate this. I didn't anticipate death and disease and sickness. I didn't anticipate Alzheimer's in my mother. I didn't anticipate this or that. And all these things pile up and suddenly you say, you know what, I'm just not listening anymore. I'm too tired to hear what God has to say. Life can deal you a curve sometimes. And what it causes you to do is you either draw closer to God through those trials or you all but shut him off, refuse to listen anymore. Same thing can happen to two different people. One of them's the butter, draw closer to God in the trial. The other one's the clay, and they shut God off and grow hard. Israel was this way too. There was another time in the New Testament where this happened. I want you to turn with me for a minute to the book of Mark, chapter 8. This is a different one too. This happens to believers. In Mark chapter 5, he fed the 5,000. How many basketfuls did he take up? 12. This time in Mark chapter 8... He feeds 4,000. How many basketfuls did he take up? Seven. You guys know your facts. That's good. This is one of the few times where Jesus kind of reviews a miracle. He's reviewing some stories from his own life. Why don't you join me at verse 14? After he fed the 4,000, now they had, gotten, uh, they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat, and he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they be began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. <laughs> Jesus was trying to use a physical thing to use and bring up a spiritual discussion on a different plane. He wants to be able to take the events of our lives in the physical world and have a spiritual meaning and have a discussion with his disciples and they absolutely don't get it. It just flies right over their heads. Oh, it's about bread. It has nothing to do with bread at all. But now listen to what Jesus says. They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the lack of bread in this boat? You worried about bread? And so what's he do? Do you yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Yes, the answer is. Why? Having eyes you don't see? Having ears don't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? And just like you guys, they knew the answer, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of broken pieces did you take up? Well, seven, they knew the answer too. Don't you get it? And the answer is no. You know what he's saying here? I can't have a spiritual discussion with you. You're not taking the lessons of the Bible class. And the reason we talk about facts and we have these recorded events of Scripture and we want our kids to know it, it's not so they know the answer is 12 and that the answer is 7. It's really to know the theological message. This man who did this was a son of God who can do anything. That's what he wants us to know. I don't care if they can answer Bible trivia, guys. I really don't. I don't think getting into heaven is going to be winning Bible trivia when you have 12 elders there. I don't think that's what it is. He wants to know, do you get the meaning of this? 
Have we studied the Bible all our lives and still don't get it? That we still don't understand his identity? It's great to know facts, y'all, but if we don't know the Savior, they're useless to us. We're supposed to see from these things and understand and have hearts that are able to see it and hear it and get it. Study the Bible over and over again for years, and you know a bunch of facts, but you don't have a belief and a trust in the God of that word. You have missed the entire thing. Your heart refuses to actually believe what you studied. I'm glad we need to teach our kids these facts because these facts at the age of four, five, six, and seven, as they mellow in their brains and as they see us practice our faith over years, when they become 14, 15, 16, it becomes a faith that they put their, their lives in the hands of their creator. It's got to start back over here. But it can't stay facts. At some point in time, they've got to trust. They've got to put their life in the hands of the God they believe in between David and Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all those stories. There are certain common times for this, this hardening of heart that for whatever reason, you've talked about God and you've studied facts all your life, but you don't really have a relationship with him at all. If every challenge that comes up in your life throws you for a loop and you lose confidence in God over and over again, despite the fact that he's proven himself over and over again, what is wrong with you? If you have been coming to church for years and yet there's still people coming to tell you you need to show up at church on Sunday mornings, if after 20 years we're trying to get you to show up at church on Sunday morning, something's gone wrong. That should be settled. It's over. It's done. It's on your calendar for per per perpetuity. That's what I like to say. Every Sunday you know where you're going to be. You don't get up and wonder, are we going? No, that's, that was settled long ago because you know him. Because you believe in him. And if every death in your family throws you into deep depression... Despite the fact that he's proven himself through the church and through the truth and through his Holy Spirit in you, there's greater challenges that are going to come ahead in your life. The ones in the past are to get you to believe in him so that when the bigger ones in the future come, you don't have the anxiety and uncertainty. Any of us taking your kids to the ER and scared to death about what you're going to find. They come out and they say to you, she's got two brain tumors in her head. You're going to have to go get some surgery stuff. And we go through a week of all that stuff. Listen, once you've been through that and you, God's gotten you through that, when you, when you later on have someone else in a situ, similar situation, you can't lose your bearings like you did before. You should trust God a little more than you did last time. He's proven himself and he's trying to nurture you and build you up in the faith. Don't just know your facts, know your God. The way I see this happening so often is that some member of the church will have kids, they've raised in the church, but for whatever reason, they hit their teenage years, college years, and they just kind of go AWOL for a while. And they go beg every church member, go visit my kid, go visit my kid, go visit my kid, as if, as if somehow or another those visits are going to be the secret magic formula. And people go and people go and there's no response. There's this hardness of heart in these young people for whatever reason in this time period of life. And, and then something drastic happens in this young person's life and the church falls over itself, falls over itself backwards to serve and to nurture and to give money and to give support. And we think if there's ever a time they're going to come back, it's now, but they don't. Maybe a week or two they do, but they don't. They drift away again. We go every once in a while and see them again, and something bad happens in their life, and we fall over ourselves backwards trying to help them and nurture. We're going to win them back. If they're ever going to get back, it's now. And they don't. Or maybe they do. This is what you call hardness of heart for whatever reason. They know full well what they should be doing. They just can't make themselves do it. It's called hardness of heart. In Exodus chapter 9, I think it's on the screen. 
verses three, uh, 34 says this, But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, once those pressing matters that caused him to give in were removed and normalcy came back, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. I'll ask you a question. Is hardening your heart or letting your heart grow hard a sin? Look at the text. Don't look at me. Look at the text. Yes. When God tells you something and it's the truth and you just can't get yourself to do it, I, I, the, the fact is you're sinning. It's a sin. And I'll tell you when this appears in the New Testament, the most frequent one, next Sunday morning we're going to be dealing with this from the Sermon on the Mount, the whole divorce and remarriage discussion. Do you know why there was ever any allowance for any kind of divorce in the Old Testament? What did Jesus say? Hardness of the heart. It's never been a matter of what does God want. It's never been a matter of what does God expect of us when we get married. That's never been the question in anybody's mind. What he wants is clear as crystal from creation. What's clear in all of the New Testament is God expects and Jesus wants us to be faithful one man to one woman for life and make that relationship as loving and glorifying to God as you can. Any aberration from that, somebody's not listening. Somebody's refusing to give God what he wants. And so when Jesus talks about this, he says, you know why we have divorce at all? Your hardness of heart. You wouldn't give God what he wants. And so God had to make an allowance for you. I think we know the answer to most of these questions of what God wants for our lives. Very few of us this week are going to sin because we're not sure what God says about what we're doing or thinking. The sin we're going to commit is not of ignorance. It's a hardness of our heart that says, I know what God wants, but I know what I want, and I'm going to do what I want. There's where our sins are. How do you do this? What can be done for an old heart like mine? Look at this next verse. In the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the symptoms of a hardened heart. What are they from looking at Pharaoh's life? But we're going to end each lesson on this, not just diagnosing it, but what can be done for a heart like this. And here's the answer. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before the Lord? Let my people go. I'm going to ask you, what is the answer? What is the cure to a hardened heart from this verse? Humble yourself. I know what I want. I know what God wants. What is humility? Giving God what He wants and denying yourself. And we will never soften our hearts until we get to this point where we give God what He wants, not what we want. And in America, this doesn't sell well. This doesn't sell to anybody. And you wonder why is the faith falling on such hard times in our culture? Here's why. Because people want to do what people want to do, not what God wants them to do. And the only way to be saved is to give God what he wants, not what you want. And it goes against every grain of my being and every fiber that there is. The answer or the cure for a hardened heart to bow on your knee when you most want to stand up and shake a fist. When you most want to fight what, what you, for what you want to do, but you bow before God and say, God, what I want to do is this. And by the way, we have an example of this happening in the garden. God, what I want to do, quite frankly, is you find another way. But... Jesus bows a knee. Actually, he collapses on the ground. You ever seen, they're putting a new funeral home in Kennett, and I got a tour of it. And they've got a stained glass window in it. 
I looked at him and said, I hate that stained glass window. Well, you're Church of Christ, you're not supposed to like them. No, it's not that. It shows this picture. Have you seen it? Of Jesus in the garden. And, and there's this big rock right here. And he's got this long flowing mane of golden, beautiful blonde hair. And he is leaning up against the stone like this. Like this. And it's a spotlight of heaven shining down on him. Oh, it's a beautiful picture. It's just a bunch of baloney. Because when you read what he did in the garden, was he ever looking like that? He was his face flat on the ground, sweating almost like drops of blood because he was fighting. He was fighting his own will. God, what I want to do is this, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what you want. And this is him making sure that he doesn't develop a hardened heart the night before he's supposed to give up or the night of giving up his life. The only answer... And response and cure for a hardened heart is when every fiber of your being is like this, but you suddenly collapse on your knees and you say, God, I'm going to give you what you want. And you know what the thing is? Sometimes you're not going to want to. You're not demanded to want to, and you're not demanded to like it. You're just demanded to do it. This week... You're going to have your moments where into your mind comes a full awareness of what you should do in this relationship or in this decision. You're going to know full well what God has called you to right here. And you're going to have a choice in that moment. Are you going to give God what he wants? Or are you going to flex your muscle and declare your independence and say, but no, I don't want to do that. I can't make myself do it. You can make yourself do it. You must. This is the battle of the ages. This is the battle that Jesus had to fight till the night before, the night he died. It's never going to go away, and it's never going to remove itself, and it's never going to be easy. It's always going to be this, and you have to decide for yourself, am I going to set up a posture for myself that I put myself on my knees and say, God, you win this one. You're, I'm going to give you exactly what you want, and I don't want to, and I don't like it. It doesn't taste good to me. I don't like any of it. I'm going to give it to you anyway, and that's when that heart of yours starts to crack and soften. The wine of his presence and his spirit softens your heart and you're a little bit closer to being like God. That's what our goal is to be. The next four weeks, bring yourself here, bring your whole life in your mind and we're going to look at these symptoms. It starts with chapter 5. You want to read chapter 5 in preparation for next Sunday? That's fine, but bring your life. We're going to talk about the first one next Sunday. And you're going to put, bring your whole life and you're going to analyze it. We're going to say, where's the hard spots, uh, hard spots of your heart? Where are they? It's in these things. And then we're going to talk about how you can humble yourself and change it. It is possible that there's somebody here who needs to repent. It could be that you've never repented in front of a group of people and just said, you know what, my way is not, or, is not right, it's Jesus' way, it's right, and I want to be immersed, but I don't think that's a Sunday night crowd very much. If that's you, the invitation is to you. But I think it's much more likely in this crowd that there's some people who are holding out and saying, you know what, I know God's been telling me. He's been beating on my brains. He's been knocking at the door saying, I want into your life and I want to be able to shape your life and mold you like a, a clay pot. And you've been fighting him and you've been resisting him and you've been refusing to do what he asked you to do. And maybe tonight you're saying, I'm tired of this battle, I want to win this. And you don't even need to come forward, you just need to, to shape up your life. But you know what, there's some people who would need the prayers of this church to help them in this battle because this battle's not easy. When Jesus was going through this battle that night, he asked for his inner three to pray with and for him. And there's some people in here who are facing a challenge in your life. You know what you should do and you're fighting it. And what you need is to ask a few inner people to pray with you. And that's this church tonight. If that would help you, that's your call. That's your invitation.
Let's sing, My Heart is Hard. And if this is about you, and you need to let it be softened, even tonight, in the presence of these people, we'd love to help you. Let's sing together. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. tonight and would like to take the Lord's Supper, we'd ask that you go out in the foyer where you'll be directed and served. And we'll sing number 373 and have our closing prayer. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our end. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary.